I'm a professor of Iberian and Latin American cultures and the faculty director of the center. Um, as is customary for us here at the Center for Latin American Studies, we're going to have one of our MA students uh, do the introductions to introduce our speaker. But before I hand it over, I just want to say how very pleased we are guys, that you're with us. And uh, thank you for all your collaboration with the center for all these, these years. Karen Vargas, a senior staff attorney. Uh, has, is going to deliver a talk entitled Human Rights Litigation and Transnational Collaboration, How Domestic Litigation in Foreign and International Courts Contributes to Accountability in Latin America. For those joining us on the live stream, please submit any questions or comments via the YouTube chat section. Kindly note that closed captioning for the live stream video will be provided in the coming weeks. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the students, Stefania Cunha Lacarieri, who will introduce our speaker. Stefania? Elena. Elena? Elena? <gasps> it's okay. Okay, okay, okay. No, I'm, I'm following a script here, as, as you can tell. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event hosted by the Center for Latin American Studies. My name is Anna Elena, and I am a master's student in the Latin American Studies program here. It is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Claret Vargas. Dr. Vargas earned her MA and PhD in Latin American and Brazilian literatures from Harvard University, where she also earned a JD from the Harvard Law School. Claret Vargas currently served as a senior staff attorney at the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco, where she has worked since 2019. Um, the Center for Justice and Accountability is a legal nonprofit that is committed to fighting for global justice for human rights abusers and developing our domestic human rights policy in the United States. Dr. Vargas has spent many years working in the domestic and international legal arenas. She previously served as the research director at MSI Integrity, an NGO investigating multi-stakeholder initiatives and human rights issues, and as the director of internationalization at De Justicia. She also served as the executive director of the Human Rights Center here at the Stanford Law School, where she taught courses on the inter-American system, human rights practices, indigenous rights movements, um, and much more revolving around Latin America. And finally, if you are interested in learning more about the inter-American human rights system after this talk, we have the great opportunity of welcoming Claret Vargas this spring to Casa Bolivar, where she will be teaching the course titled The Inter-American Human Rights System, Doctrine, Practice, and Advocacy. And without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Vargas. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to the Center for Latin American Studies for this uh, invitation. It's such a delight to be back here um, and to be speaking to kind of the broader uh, Center for Latin American Studies audience. And, uh, I've, I've taught courses here before, but it's always great to get to know um, the wider audience. So uh, as I was preparing to, to present this, I was writing out my thoughts, it occurred to me that um, for this talk, I should also be explicit about the interdisciplinary collaboration that is necessary for effective change and meaningful 
meaningful impact, and not just transnational collaboration in the realm of, of um, uh, litigation and the legal. Um, and so I thought maybe this is a better title. Sorry to uh, bait the switch. Um, if, hopefully I'll cover both, but I thought that litigation, advocacy, art, and memory, cross-disciplinary and transnational collaborations to address impunity for atrocity crimes in Latin America was a more accurate story of how human rights advocacy takes place on the ground, and at least in my advocacy experience. But being the lawyer here, let me start with litigation, and then weave my way back into the necessary interconnectedness of these strands of the movement uh, for human rights protection in Latin America. So let me just start um, by talking about the litigation work I do. Um, uh, I work on Torture Victim Protection Act litigation, which is um, the Torture Victim Protection Act is a statute uh, that allows um, victims or survivors of uh, extrajudicial killings or torture uh, committed abroad to bring a case here, a civil case though, um, against a perpetrator who happens to be uh, under jurisdiction of a U.S. court. So whether they're here passing through, uh, you know, on a shopping vacation, which is not uncommon, um, or have moved here, um, if a victim identifies that person and knows where they are, it is possible to bring a case. Um, the cases, though, and this is just um, you know a screenshot of of, of our web page of the CJ web page. As you'll see here, the way we think about these cases is not just about the family, the victim versus the perpetrator. It's not, um, that is just the smallest part of it, uh, both for the families and survivors and uh, for us as uh, litigators who focus on strategic litigation. If you notice, even the font and the size of the font tells you something about where our focus is. And that is that we are focused on um, cases that are emblematic of broader violations. And what we try to do is um, assist a human rights movement already ongoing either amongst, uh, in the country where the uh, atrocities took place, or if that is barred for people to advocate that in some situations the diaspora community who might be advocated from the outside in the hopes of some time you know, in the future having accountability in country. Um, so, ooh. sorry, switched, thank you. Um, so the considerations that we, that we have or what we kind of think about when we're deciding whether we're going to start, um, we're going to pursue a case is of course, uh, survivor, victim, family of a victim will come to us um, with information or they will be referred to us by a partner organization um, and we will think about the potential impact of our case not just can we win or not is the case viable or not but we will think about what, what kind of impact can our case have on the efforts on the ground so it requires us to become contextually kind of very competent on the specific context of that country it requires us to understand, you know, will this help, will it mean nothing, or will it actually hurt because of the political context right now? Mm. Um, and it requires us to develop partnerships, and these are very, very key. Partnerships, hey Luke, come on in. I just want to welcome one of my co-counsel in one of our uh, current live cases, uh, and so thank you so much for being here. Um, so it requires us to, to consider and get to know um, actors on the ground. So who are the advocates in the country? What is the broad human rights agenda in the country? Uh, because if we design a campaign without a deep partnership and a deep understanding of the needs and goals of not just our clients, but also the movement that is of their community of, of advocates, um, if we don't take those into considerations, then, uh, as one of my colleagues likes to say, we're just bringing a case to take like a, a victory lap, and that's it. So what is the impact? And sometimes that means that some cases that we may file may end up losing, right? But they may have a strategic reason for being brought. 
Um, some of the things that um, we have managed to get have been, you know, has been information, evidence that was not possible to get otherwise, either because there was a witness in the U.S. who would not be willing um, to speak um, because there's no prosecution in, in the country where things are happening, and so this is the only way, or even because there might be some documents that we can compel from uh, the perpetrator in the U.S. that he refused to provide while in this country, and this was kind of the situation in, in one of our cases um, with Luke, so I'm glad you're here right for that mention. Um, so, when I think of these, these are just some of the considerations, but it's about, and I think the considerations in, in, partner, in, in deciding whether to uh, get involved in a case and in developing partnerships also reflects you know, our ethos in terms of kind of a horizontal, collaborative relationship with partners on the ground, uh, kind of ensuring that our clients are also interested in this broader impact, right? Because if that is not the goal of our client, we're doing a disservice to them by, by trying to do this. If their only goal is just to, to, to have a um, very kind of private, unique case, then we are likely not the people to work with them, um, even if the case is viable. And so we bring all these considerations. And so the, the first question is, what can it do? What can a TVPA case achieve? And does it match the goal, goals of the victims or families? And then do the goals of the victims of, and families like align with the broader human rights goals of um, of the community where they come from. Um, and the, what do we hope that the litigation will yield? Okay, one of the, the, there's many things, but one of them is the opportunity for our clients to face the perpetrators in a court and to get the satisfaction of a ruling that says you did this and it was wrong. And um, that can be part of a reparation and of holding someone accountable, even if it's not a criminal accountability proceeding, can be actually very healing. And I will talk mostly about a case in, related to Argentina, but I wanted to bring into this a case connected to Chile before, just to speak about what can, what can happen, right? Um, we uh, presented, we litigated a case of, of uh, called the Barrientos case in Florida of one of the murderers of the famous folk singer Victor Jara in Chile. Uh, we represented his family and um, we won the case in 2015 or 2016. Um, and it was, as a civil case is, it was only, it was kind of a declaration that you know he was responsible for this, there's a presentation of evidence, there's a trial. Um, and then there was a monetary compensation that is likely very hard to collect just because the person might be, you know, uh, just <laughs> uh, it, unable to pay. And so what, it, what exactly did we get in the end? Well, what we got was a lot of evidence that was collected in a way that is intelligible and makes sense to a U.S. court and to U.S. prosecutors. And what ended up happening is that although Chile had been waiting for an extradition for many years, it had requested an extradition years and years ago, um, it hadn't progressed, it hadn't moved. Um, and the Office of uh, in, uh, Inter uh, Immigration Litigation at the Department of Justice brought a case of denaturalization, that is uh, stripping uh, Barrientos of his citizenship uh, because he committed fraud uh, in his application. Uh, that's because the application for citizenship includes questions about whether someone was in the military, whether someone persecuted uh, individuals uh, for a variety of impermissible reasons, whether someone participated in the overthrow of a government, all things that Mr. Barrientos was found to have participated in. Um, and so the evidence from our case was really like just it, it was served on a platter, in a way, to this case, and they cited our case, and they cited the public documents, and ultimately, the court decided this on the papers, and uh, stripped Mr. Barrientos of his citizenship, and subsequently, he was removed to Chile. 
about two months ago, and, and he is now in Chile, uh, where there is an open prosecution for his participation in that murder and in other uh, violations. So I see this as kind of our involvement in cases goes well beyond the confines of the trial, right? It continues as we develop relationships with individuals here, with partners on the ground, and as we continue to have in mind what is the main goal of our clients. Because no client comes to us saying, I want monetary compensation, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. No, they want justice, and this is uh, kind of a, a next best alternative to having an opportunity for justice in country um, that is legitimate, that is satisfactory, that is fair. Um, so, how does CVPA fit in larger advocacy plans? I think I was, I hope I, I've described some of that through the story um, of our Chile case. And so, let's move on to advocacy. So, when do we coordinate litigation with other forms of advocacy? I would say we do that before, during, and after trial. We, we are always thinking about the fact that a successful case and a beautiful ruling with language that kind of extols somebody's rights is not going to have any impact if we hadn't, haven't laid the groundwork for implementation, right? If we haven't laid the groundwork for it to have an impact, it's just not going to go very far beyond a news report saying that we won this case, right? And so, what are we trying to do? And we're, we're trying to figure out where does this fit in the larger arc of um, interventions for human rights, for to develop a human rights respecting um, set of institutions and a human rights respecting culture in country, right? Um, and and so we are constantly thinking about this. And sometimes it's a long tail. We just I am just working now on facilitating evidence um, that was developed in one of our earliest cases um, in the early 2000s. And so, and sometimes our clients come back to us. Now there's an opportunity. Now the courts have opened up. Now the amnesties have been um, invalidated. We've preserved this evidence through the civil trials. And so it makes the work of a prosecutor who may be understaffed, under-resourced by design, right? So it may be that a government sometimes are willing to, to, to prosecute, but they drag their feet, they, they choke resources, they don't actually put all the weight behind this. And so we come in as, how can we help? How can we help this human rights agenda move forward? Um, I think I already asked what we hope we be sealed. Sorry for the repetition. How we think. So coordination to me works best when it's uh, exchange of information and expertise that goes both ways. So how does this work best? When we listen, we listen really well. Uh, what are about, you know, what does our partner on the ground or our partners on the ground know? How have they done their work before? What can we learn from them? And in most of our cases, we wouldn't have any evidence if it weren't because our partners conducted investigations, right? And so we are not there to kind of bring our expertise. We are there to be uh, joint experts along with our partners. And I think that that develops deeper relationships that give us opportunities where they can call us up and say, hey, we're doing this campaign. Can you contribute to it? Can you collaborate? Can you add something to it? Do you have any news from the case that could add to this particular moment? Um, otherwise, we're just kind of being in touch whenever we have an update on the case. And that's, to me, um, not exactly a formula for uh, deep partnerships. And so I, I really put a lot of value, we as an organization put a lot of value in these deep partnerships because that is what gives us an entry point into being part of this movement and not just the lawyers who showed up for this case and then removed themselves. It also means that our engagement with countries often means a repeated engagement. Once we have relationships, we may be called on to do more cases because we've done them before there. 
Um, and I think that that also answers the question of how do we build on work with prior um, or concurrent advocacy. But I want to add just one really, really important point. In Latin America, because there's a regional human rights system that has been heavily used by advocates, and this is also a plug for my course that I'm teaching on the inter-American system, but I will say, oftentimes, the chain of events that leads to our ability to, to bring a case is really, really, really connected to um, uh, the human rights advocacy of other actors who work with the inter-American system and then obtain, like, got jurisprudence, got decisions that are binding on all, um, kind of, on, on a good number of countries in Latin America. Before I move into this, let me just give you a small bit of context, which is the inter-American human rights system um, kind of is composed of the commission and the court. And the commission has jurisdiction over all uh, members of the Organization of American States. That includes Canada, the US, and all countries in the Americas, um, except a few that have just uh, removed themselves from it, including Venezuela. But just and, um, and the court has jurisdiction over the countries that have signed the American Convention on Human Rights, which is a treaty. And a treaty is, you know, for those of you who are lawyers, pacta sunt servanda. It's it's an essential part of of uh, of um, the way in which advocates have gotten have pushed their government is to say, you sign this treaty, you are supposed to comply with the treaty. And so it's a human rights treaty, which makes its compliance kind of difficult. But it is there. Um, and, uh, and also the countries have to have accepted jurisdiction of the court. What makes this even more powerful or gives, gives advocates a little bit more space to, to advocate is that in the transitions out of the dictatorships across the Americas, there were constitutional amendments, constitutional assemblies that rewrote the Constitution. In the case of Colombia, it wasn't a transition from dictatorship, but it was a 1991 constitution. In all those cases, the constitutions included uh, human rights treaties that their country had signed. So the majority of these countries that have had new constitutions in transitions have constitutionalized international human rights treaties. What that means is that an international human rights treaties and the country's obligations um, uh, in uh, to those treaties or to the terms of those treaties are on equal footing as the Constitution. So part of advocates' works early on was to educate the judiciary into how they should be interpreting uh, questions related to human rights violations given the content of international human rights treaties. So this sounds very heady, but hopefully I'll have an anecdote that makes this kind of more alive in a minute. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, it is 25, um, so you still have a good 15 minutes if you want to use them. Okay, so let me then um, turn to storytelling, which I think is always a good way to talk through these kind of complex issues. I'm going to talk about the Trelu massacre. For context, Trelu um, is a town in the south, in the, in the Patagonia region of Argentina, very far. Um, it's a cold uh, it, you know, it, it has very cold winters. Um, it's, uh, I think, in 1972, it was about two days uh, worth of a bus travel to get from Buenos Aires to Trelu. Um, it also was uh, the home of uh, one of three uh, high security prisons that were uh, enabled by uh, the then dictator Lanuse uh, to hold political prisoners. One of them was a boat. Uh, uh, kind of a, a large uh, ship uh, in, off the coast of Buenos Aires, and another one was in the north. Okay, so what happened in the Trilu massacre? So on August 22nd, 1972, in the early morning hours, around 3 a.m., 19 political prisoners, these are their names, um, were, they were held at the Almirante Sar naval base in the city of Trelu, province of Chubut, in the Patagonian south of Argentina. They were awakened by naval officers. Uh, their cell doors were opened all at once. They were told to exit the cells, put their mattresses away, and line up. 
and then uh, they were shot with machine guns and pistols. 16 prisoners died on August 23, 1972. Three survived. The three who survived are in red. Alberto Camps, Maria Berger, Ricardo Aydar. Um, but the three were also later killed or disappeared during the 1976 to 1983 dictatorship, the Proceso, uh, which is the most recent dictatorship in Argentina. In 2012, three officers were convicted in Argentina for the Trilu massacre. In 2022, 50 years since the massacre, the family members of four victims highlighted here um, in bold, or bolded, um, the family members of four victims got a jury verdict in federal court in Florida against the only officer who had managed to evade criminal prosecution for this massacre. The jury held Roberto Guillermo Bravo responsible for the extrajudicial killing of Ana Maria Villarreal, Eduardo Capello, and Ruben Bonet and the attempted extrajudicial killing and torture of Alberto Miguel Camps. The case is under appeal, so I will only share what is public, and I'm not going to comment on the appeal. Um, but I think um, I can still tell you enough about this um, to kind of uh, deal with the issues that bring us here. So on August 22nd, the same day of the massacre, right after the massacre news, the Lanuse regime hastily enacted a law that criminalized the dissemination of information about that, that was contrary to the official military's version. The military's version was that um, this was in self-defense, that they were attacked by the prisoners um, and that they shot back. Um, so why it was that they were all out and um, we can go over and over it, but it, this was the, 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 the narrative. But it's interesting that there was a law that made it a crime to kind of disseminate information that didn't agree with them. And the way they would say it is that it disseminated information communicated by subversives. But the definition of subversive is very flexible, and it can mean anything. Um, the bodies of the deceased were returned in sealed coffins. Um, People were pressured to sign agreements to bury their dead right away if uh, some did not agree, but many had to. Um, and where there were funerals, there were large processions and people coming to pay their respects. And the funerals were attacked. He, and so this is law 19797, which is the law that makes it a crime to disseminate information. Oh, there's a, oh, there. Um, sorry, I'm, for those <laughs> live streaming, I'm, I'm marveling at a pointer that, <laughs> that comes with my remote. Anyway, so this is the law, and these are pictures of the funeral, a funeral with tanks and horse, uh, police uh, riding horses. Why? Because they attacked the funerals, they tried to get them over with as fast as they could. They attempted to take the bodies during the funerals. Um, this is the pictures of the funerals uh, of three individuals, um, Sabeli, Capello, and Villarreal de Santucho. Um, the same thing happened with Jorge Ulla, uh, someone who was buried in Santa Fe, a different city. Um, there were hundreds of people there. Um, in the morning of the, of the burial, uh, there were tanks with their cannons pointed at, uh, at uh, the apartment of the father of uh, Jorge Ulla and um, Julio Ulla, the brother, who was a doctor, um, was there as well. Um, and uh, at some point in the procession, the police and the military just attacked and took over the hearse and drove away with it. Julio Ulla jumped into the hearse and hugged the, the um, coffin because he thought they were going to take away the body. Um, and instead what they did was rush to the to the cemetery to just get it over with. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who have been following the, the news of Navalny recently, this will resonate quite a bit. The lack of access to the body immediately after the death is especially significant to me. It was interesting because um, that is what they were doing you know, 50 years ago. Like we're sending this sealed, you may not find out exactly how they died, bury them right away. No, you cannot do an autopsy. Um, so, 
So what we have is a moment when people know that the version that the military is telling is, is not right and that they're trying to hide something, but you don't know anything else. And so art and public mourning, in this case, created a space for retelling what people believed had really happened and to have a common, what I like to think of as an anti-narrative. They want to have a common anti-narrative. And what do I mean by anti-narrative here? Um, it's that it is basically we know that what the military told us, the official narrative, is not true. We know this was a massacre, but we don't have the full picture. So we don't have the true narrative, but we know this narrative is false. And so what we are going to weave is an anti-narrative, a rejection of the official version until that gap, that empty hole, is filled with what really happened, right? Um, and the story of brutality, so, and so what are these? This is a poem, uh, 16, Dieciséis Rosas Rojas. It's, it's a poem that was um, written immediately after, um, and it was read at many of the funerals and at the memorials afterwards. Um, and it's still recited today at events. In fact, I was at an event where this somebody stood up and just recited this poem by memory. Um, and the poem also has been uh, kind of uh, uh, put in, uh, in tiles in certain places in Buenos Aires as well. What else do we, do we have to build this anti-narrative? That is to, to say, hey, there's some evidence that the story that the military is telling us is not true. We don't know the full story, but we have elements that let us know that what they're telling us isn't right and we are right to reject it. Um, and so that's what I like to think of in terms of, because the, the survival of the anti-narrative is really what gives weight to the demand for the real narrative, right? Um, so what else feeds this anti-narrative? Well, legal documents. Legal documents like Alicia Bonet, Maria Antona Berger, the Sabelli family, and the Santucho family all filed civil complaints in the 70s, immediately after the killings. The survivors got to tell what they remembered, what they witnessed, but many questions remained unanswered. Who were these officers? Where are they now? Why did they shoot them, right? And then, as people begin to ask questions, file cases, um, try to depose people, the persecution of family members, the persecution of anybody who's saying, what, asking what happened, is, it begins. And so, um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Let me just go through other uh, documents or texts or forms of, of preserving narrative. Uh, there's journalism uh, and storytelling. So this book, Releu, uh, La Patria Fusilada. Francisco Rondo's book, it was part investigative report, part interview, part review, part review of official documents. It actually preserved a section of the autopsy of Ruben Bonet because Alicia Bonet fought her way into demanding that they allow her to um, exhume her husband's body and have uh, an autopsy. Um, and it's the only body, I believe, who's had, like, had an official full autopsy report. Um, but this book, uh, and I would love to know if anybody has heard of this event before, but uh, it's, it's shocking even to me. But this book, like many others, were part of the 1976 book burning campaign called Operación Claridad. Anybody heard of Operación Claridad? Yeah, so in 1976, there was a book burning campaign it was a little bit like the current like um, a, a listing of offensive books that we are having, like this mm -hmm. wave. They were listed. There were kind of uh, groups. Of, and there's photos, if you just look up Operación Claridad, of, uh, and in 1976, that's what's really shocking, of, of just um, basically little towers made up of these books that were being burned. Um, and the message is clear, right? We're burning these. Okay, maybe you have a copy at your house, but we better not find one when we go knock on your door and search your house for subversive materials, right? So it's, it's more than just taking access away. It's saying, if you have this information, you are a criminal, right? Um, and so through the years, though, this anti-narrative and memory of 
we don't know the full truth persists. There are memorials. There are, those memorials are often interrupted by the police with people being arrested and beaten up. There are songs. There are private efforts to remember. So there's poetry. And the common thread in all these interventions is the story is pieced together incompletely because the government will not give access or conduct a full investigation. And the government, in fact, is engaging in brutal silencing. This is an illustration of some of the stories that were told, some of the testimony presented during our trial. We had a fantastic illustrator who um, kind of captured the essence of, of, of the testimony. So what, what are forms of silencing? Alberto Camps, one of the survivors, who could tell what happened, who could have identified by sight, even if he didn't know the name of anybody who committed these crimes, well, he was extrajudicially executed one day uh, the military uh, attacked his home and uh, where he was in hiding with his wife and uh, infant daughter and three-year-old son. They abducted the, uh, his wife and the three-year-old son right outside their house and they had a shootout with, like they shot inside the house of Alberto and he hid his daughter Raquel under the bed to keep her safe. Um, the mom uh, was tortured and disappeared. Uh, the three-year-old and the infant were also disappeared for a short amount of time, um, and they were returned to their uh, grandparents a few weeks after. It is understood that they were returned um, in exchange for something uh, from their mother, but soon after that, their mother disappeared. So um, this is not the kind of silencing that one can kind of shake off after a few years. Ana Maria Saveli's father, one of the people who presented a lawsuit uh, in the 70s, the Navy murdered him and her mother committed suicide. The Pujadas family, who, in, in, in the family of one of the prisoners, was abducted, like the whole family, tortured, thrown in a well with explosives and detonated. All were killed but one, and that survivor died of wounds soon after. Only a 12-year-old and a 6-year-old who were locked in the bathroom, they were locked by the military in the bathroom and not taken, survived. And again, all these things took place around the anniversary, the month of August, where um, these prisoners had tried to escape from a prison and then were recaptured and then were put in the Almirante Zar naval base. Um, we, art and, and, and narrative and theater are part of how we keep memory alive, they're also part of how memory is silenced mm -hmm. and battled with. Mm -hmm. And so the theatrics of the persecution, the fact that for all the survivors' families and all the, the victims' families, the, the week between you know, August 14 and August 22nd was a deadly week every year. Mm -hmm. People went on vacation, left country, left town, uh, went into hiding for that week just for fear that they were next. Um, so, and then um, Eduardo Capello's family, who also filed a complaint, suffered similar persecution. Eduardo Capello's mom and dad uh, filed a civil complaint, just like these other individuals. And their, and their son, Jorge, the brother of Eduardo, was very affected by the death of Eduardo. And so he started showing up at... Um, at memorials, asking questions, you know, demanding uh, transparency. He became a target of the military. He and his wife and his 12-year-old stepson, so the son of, of his wife from a prior marriage, were abducted. Um, Eduardo Capello had, uh, Jorge Capello named his infant son after his brother. So Eduardo, who is my client, was a baby and he survived only because he happened to be at his grandparents' house. So, given all these obstacles to investigation, what has made our case possible? What makes any of our cases possible? What makes accountability for atrocity possible when it's not just an individual crime, but it's the entire apparatus of the state kind of a, working to prevent you from get, getting the truth? Well. 
What helped us was the dedication of the families, their decades-long efforts to uncover what happened and to keep the massacre from being forgotten. There were times when there was nothing they could do to further investigations, but what they could do was to keep the memory alive, to talk about it, to remember it, to use the anniversary as more than just, are we going to die this year because we're going to get persecuted, but to say this is the anniversary of not just a tragedy, but a great injustice. And that is what families did on their own, uncoordinated, right? Um, and to great risk. Who else? Our partners. We partnered with a fantastic NGO that everybody should know, the Center for Legal and Social Studies in Argentina. Um, they are kind of human rights advocates since the time of the dictatorship. They were, in fact, founded by uh, uh, scholars and lawyers whose children were disappeared. They brought habeas corpus cases when they knew that there was no point just to keep the record of them. Um, and they are insistent on forcing the Argentinian legal system to hold its own accountable. Like, it cannot be outside. It's, it's us. We have to have this prosecution. Um, and so they provided some contents of why this case mattered. And one of the main reasons why it mattered is because it happened before the 1976 coup. So before the biggest, most famous uh, dictatorship and violations, the 1972 events are kind of a dress rehearsal, a dry run for the atrocities that happened in the next dictatorship. And one of the big important things of this case, historically, in terms of the historic memory in Argentina, is to establish that, you know, to hold all those accountable and to say, like, we are still seeking justice, no matter how long it takes. Um, and to say the crimes that happened before 1976 were also crimes against humanity. So that was kind of um, the big push. And that is why they brought this case in 2005. But how did they bring this case in 2005? And why 2005? Why wait so long, right? And so this is where I want to talk about collaboration and the way in which transnational collaboration has worked amongst Latin American advocates. They couldn't have brought this case before because there was an amnesty, a very famous set of amnesty laws, punto final y obediencia de vida, due obedience and uh, full stop laws. Uh, one of them provided a really ridiculously short statute of limitations, and the other one said that the defense of I was following orders was sufficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were then after that some pardons of the few people who had gotten uh, tried. If anybody has seen Argentina 1985, this film that came out this year, Argentina 1985, it was really the only trial that was kind of, of, of high level officers. They were pardoned by uh, 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 democratic presidents. Why? Because there was so much fear of a return of democracy. The democracy was weak. Hmm. So, how could we bring this case? Well, Peru. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is this. There were a number of countries in Latin America who thought they, they, they had it, like the transition figured out. So we transition back to democracy, but we amnesty ourselves before that. And so we provide a bar to us being able to be investigated. Um, there were many, many attempts to reverse this. But as I said, one of the things that happened also, and unrelated to a specific case, was that international human rights instruments were being constitutionalized. They were becoming part of the constitution and the obligations of the state. In the case of Peru, there were a number of cases, the most famous of which, Barrios Altos in La Cantuta, about um, extrajudicial killings, human rights violations committed by uh, the Fujimori regime in its uh, kind of campaign against Sendero Luminoso that wasn't just against Sendero Luminoso, which was a terrorist group, but kind of swooped in anybody and everybody who could be, you know, who was suspected of being connected. Um, the case could not be prosecuted because there was an amnesty, and the Barrios Altos uh, case was then taken up to the Inter-American Court on the basis that people were being denied the right to access to justice, the protections under what are Articles 8 and 25 of the, of the American Convention. The court decided or ruled that uh, it was a violation of the American Convention to have blanket amnesties, um, statutes of limitations, or any other kind of bar to the investigation and prosecution of crimes against humanity. But for that, you have to show that the crime, the crime that you're trying to investigate was part of a crime against humanity. 
I won't bore you with the details of what constitutes a crime against humanity, but this is kind of a high bar. It's not just anything. So there were some amnesties that can stand up to this obligation, um, but not, not an extermination of an entire group of people in our apartment, which is what happened in the La Cantuta case. Right? They, they kind of shot up an entire um, neighborhood party. And, um, uh, and the day or the weeks after the Resaltos case came out in 2005, the Cell Center of Leon for Social Studies, our partners, and again, like these kind of typings, I, I love their work, and anybody who wants to know about smart advocacy should study their work. Um, but they filed um, an, a, additional information to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court in Argentina was considering um, whether um, this case called Simon, Caso Simon, uh, decided in 2005, whether um, the amnesty and the, the amnesty laws prevented investigation of, of an officer for something that was a crime against humanity. Um, and it was in the context of a new administration having attempted to change the law and, and kind of invalidate the amnesty in 2003. So was this invalidation possible or not? There, there were many technical um, questions, but the key was that the court decided in 2005, the Supreme Court, under the Simone case, that the amnesties were invalid. It also happened to be a government that was intent on advancing prosecutions. And so the floodgates for prosecutions opened. If people want to talk about successful advocacy of before an international human rights body, you should go to the webpage of the prosecutor uh, in Argentina and look for information on their prosecutions on crimes against humanity. To date, last time I checked, there were 1,100 convictions of officers, military, and private individuals. I don't know that there's another country or another uh, a special tribunal that can say that they've prosecuted and convicted more than 1,100 individuals responsible for uh, mass human rights violations. Um, and that's possible because of a Peruvian case, which was then used successfully by Argentinians and has been used successfully by Salvadorians, who then got the amnesty in El Salvador invalidated in 2016. So there is a great deal of coordination and, and there's a great deal of importance in the advocacy that countries across South America do because it can impact positively or negatively the outcomes of many individuals. So I probably have like less than <laughs> negative five minutes left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move very fast because the rest is not as... I wanted to talk to you about art. And so to say just that the part of the, part of the work that art and narrative do, which legal proceedings can't, is to expose what I like to think of the size and the shape of the blast radius of an atrocity. Because what we cover in a litigation is limited by what's relevant to the claims and what's admissible as evidence. And not everything can be. Who is this? This is Pablo Miguez. It's, um, it's a sculpture in the Park of Memory in Buenos Aires of a 12-year-old who um, is thought of being the youngest person who was taken to the torture center at ISMA. Uh, he is thought of, uh, he's never been found. Uh, he was last seen at ESMA, and they think that he died in a death flight. And the death flights in Argentina are this phenomenon where every Wednesday uh, they would take 15 to 20 prisoners, uh, sedate them, put them in an airplane, take them over the river plate or over mm -hmm. the ocean and drop them so they could never be found. And this was done over the course of two weeks, once a week. Um, how do we know this? Because one of the pilots or one of the officers who was in charge of pushing people off um, talked about it uh, in a book called The Flight. Um, he talked to uh, um, Horacio Verovitsky, who is a very famous investigative journalist. And that, the, 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 this, it's called the Silingo effect. That the officer was named Silingo. His storytelling kind of reopened the debate because people were like, let's think about the future. Just more art 
and memorialization, and um, you know, I'm happy to talk about it later, but this is memory, right? How are we building memory? And I will close with this. This is my last slide, I swear. Um, so when we finished our trial and we won a jury trial here, the family members told us that they have a, a practice, a habit, a tradition amongst victims' families in Argentina. And that is that when they get together, somebody stands up and says everybody's name who's been disappeared or who died. And you say the name, and it's a call and response, where you say the name, and then everybody says present. And you say the name of somebody else, and you say present. And then when the last person comes out, you know, the last name of someone who's been killed or disappeared is there, you said present, now, and always. And so this is what they're doing. They're saying out the names, one by one, and then cheering for them, and keeping the memory of the Trelew massacre victims alive. alive which is a task that has been shouldered by the families and the next generation of these families. And what I will say is Bravo managed, Bravo, the perpetrator that we sued, managed to avoid extradition twice, and he's in his 80s. And the families will not give up the efforts to see him tried in Argentina. But for now, we can at least say that he did not get to enjoy his impunity without having to face the families, without being exposed to his crimes, and one of my clients always says, the only battle that we lose is the one we don't fight. And I believe that. The very fact that this effort, our effort, has fueled uh, a movement, if only for a little time, is what I see as effective transnational and uh, collaboration. We asked how we could help. What were the goals of our partners and clients? We devised a strategic litigation campaign to reach those goals. And we continue to collaborate with our partners and clients we are in the fight with them. We are part of a movement uplifting the human rights agenda of the people who fought for five decades for their right to memory, truth, and justice. Thank you. On behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies, here's a small token of oh, appreciation for it. Thank you. We all, we all need more swag in our lives. <laughs> I like swag. <laughs> I will use this mug all the time. I know, I know. I, I use mine all the time. And also what uh, I'd like to propose is that we uh, adjourn the recorded portion pretty much now mm -hmm. so we can continue the conversation amongst ourselves. So I'm going to make a couple of announcements. Yeah, yeah. Um, sit down. One is you should all take Claret Vargas' class uh, <laughs> next quarter. It's a great opportunity to learn more about the inter-American system. Indeed, I know I... If I'm allowed, I'd yes. love to attend and sit at the back of the room, be the fly on the wall. Uh, thank you for that in advance. Um, then I'd also like to announce if you want to talk more about uh, law and humanities, law and culture, this afternoon at 3.30 at the Central Humanities Center, uh, Hei and Lee is going to be discussing uh, her latest book on issues, on, on notions of uh, justice in China with uh, Marco Wan, who is the uh, editor of Law and Literature as a journal. Joseph Wager in the back is organizing that event. He can tell you more about it. And I took class. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and offered an endorsement. Yes, of course. Um, thank you all for joining us via the live stream. Um, next Friday, we're going to have uh, Professor Beatriz Jaguaribe, uh, a complete alumna, as it happens, uh, delivering a talk entitled Archives of the Wilderness, Expeditions, and Imaginaries in 20th Century Brazil. So make sure to tune in for that and to join us in person. Uh, so for now, let us adjourn and continue the conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, questions. What's our folks' minds? Yes, please.